Perfect. Okay. So, uh, as Raj mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CTO at StrongDM, and today, of course, we're going to be talking about zero trust. Um, there we go. Sorry, I've got a lot of demo materials over here. Here we go. All right, and you'll be hearing more about what StrongDM, what we do with StrongDM in a few moments. Um, but this is also going to be a pretty short talk, so uh, when something I show or tell uh, piques your interest, um, please come see me after. Uh, I'll be loitering around here somewhere, so come see me. Uh, uh, favorite part about reInvent is definitely talking to each of you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so please come see me, we'll have a chat. All right. Um, so let's go ahead with, uh, with one additional little bit of housekeeping. Um, out of respect for your time and attention, I want to help you confirm whether this is the right talk for you. Uh, so I've got a few statements that I'd like you to reflect on. So if you answer yes to all of these statements, then congratulations, you've already got zero trust access, okay? So here we go. Um, the first statement is, you know, my information systems, they're not critical to my organization. All right, second statement. Data breaches aren't really a big deal. I don't know, if any, I don't know how many of you feel that way. I don't know, some people feel that way. All right, how about, uh, I love handling passwords, keys, and secrets. Uh, the more touches, the better. Is that, I don't know, did any of you feel strongly about that? Okay. Um, a fourth one is, I love my VPN. I hear that sometimes, I hear people say that. I love my VPN. I wake up, I dream about it, my VPN is great. Uh, also, uh, maybe my colleagues and I have only those privileges that are necessary for our jobs. That seems like a pretty common state of affairs. All right, how about every button click and every gesture and every command is continuously authorized in my environment according to a centralized policy? That's like a bit of a mouthful. How about I have enough evidence to prove these claims during an audit? Anyone feel yeah, like they have an abundance of evidence? All right, so if you answered yes to all these statements, you can just run out of here and I won't be offended, all right? Um, but for those of us that remain, um, let's think about why we didn't answer yes to some of those. So since 2010, John Kindervog has gifted us with some pretty powerful ideals around zero trust. Um, zero trust isn't about eliminating trust, but about verifying that trust continuously. Zero trust um, isn't about uh, 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 allowing, uh, sorry, uh, it's, about, it's about authenticating and authorizing every one of these, uh, every time. And then focusing from, shifting the focus from defending the perimeter to securing data and resources directly. Um, I think that's something we know about the ideals of zero trust. But here's my take on why uh, 13 years later, we're still getting to zero trust. The principles have always been attractive. So they've, the goals and the claims have always been correct. However, the implementation has always implied an unprecedented level of really invasive surgery in every software application. Continuous authorization means every button, indeed every byte, must be guarded by the question, is this action allowed? Okay, that's a lot of software to write. Of course, at StrongDM, we know there is a way to achieve zero trust with zero waiting, zero pain, and zero compromises. And the secret, which we call dynamic access, is to stop waiting for apps to be rewritten to zero trust principles and just start using them. And since we're at an AWS event, uh, I do want to point out uh, a clever trick that some of the competitors of AWS used after S3 became the dominant object store in the cloud. Rather than asking folks to change their applications, they built an API that's compatible with S3. So if you had an app that spoke S3, it could also store objects to vendor X, Y, and Z. Strong DM dynamic access adds zero trust API compatibility to all of your infrastructure and applications without rewrites. Strong DM dynamic access begins with identity, and to identity, we add context. We add context from your device. We add context.
about time and location, and even context about traditional network properties, uh, such as IP addresses. So what else can we know to narrow the aperture further? We can know what application this request is targeting. Uh, we can know if the application is hosted on AWS. We might even know tags or attributes of the underlying infrastructure. If we look inside the protocol, we might understand even more about the action. So let's see what a little bit of this looks like uh, in real life, okay? Demo time, let's. All right, so the story begins uh, here on my workstation. And you'll note that I have no access. So I have zero standing privileges. Uh, I'm logged in, I've authenticated in a passwordless fashion with my identity provider, it happens to be Okta in this case. And then nothing else is happening. I, I can't do anything. But I have a task that requires access to a Linux server and a task that requires access to a database, okay? So let's go about requesting that access uh, through um, uh, a number of channels, okay? So one channel we could request access is obviously chat ops. So that's a pretty powerful method. So you can see here I'm interacting uh, with some of these, let's say an EKS cluster, I'm requesting access to that. I might provide a reason for why I need that access. Another channel for requesting access is in the identity provider itself. So let's be over here in Okta in the identity provider. And let's say the moment I gain access to a role or a group upstream in Okta, the StrongDM client and system is going to recognize that and actually reveal access to all of the underlying resources that are part of that engineering role. Okay, so now from my workstation, without a VPN, without passwords, without secrets, I now have access to all of these wonderful resources to do my job, okay? So let me just then do the next natural thing, which is I'm gonna issue an SSH command, okay? That SSH command is gonna log me into the server, um, and you'll note I didn't handle a key, I didn't touch a password. It's the same story for databases. So I'm gonna open my favorite, uh, my favorite database tool of choice, and then I'm gonna to connect to that database. Again, I have no idea what username or password, I have no idea what host name, I'm not using a VPN, okay? I'm just interacting with the database in the normal, familiar way, it feels exactly like a database, okay? Let's take one more scenario, um, where I now have a level of privilege that's associated with the engineering role, but I wanna escalate that privilege uh, to perform an operation on a Windows server. So let's go ahead through a workflow and request access to that server. So in this case, you know what? I really need access to this Active Directory server to perform an operation. So let's say I need to patch AD, okay? So the very same system that granted me access to the database, granted me access to the Linux system, is now granting me access to this Active Directory server. And because of the way this workflow is configured, uh, my access is approved. So my next step is to simply, of course, open Windows Remote Desktop and connect to that server. There we go. And uh, while the Wi-Fi is letting us through to that, uh, that Windows machine, you'll note that this is exactly the same authorization, access, authentication procedure for all of these systems, okay? Uniform across every protocol, every system type. And it uh, looks like, there we go, there's the Wi-Fi. All right, looks like somebody was trying to figure out how to install WSL on this poor Active Directory server. Okay, we can, uh, we can disconnect from that now. All right, so we've accessed a, a Windows machine, we've accessed some Linux machines, we've accessed a database. Um, but you'll also note, these are all pretty coarse grain interactions. We either have access or we don't have access. So I did promise uh, some fine-grained authorization. So let's see how policy and fine-grained authorization can play a role in helping us uh, govern some of this access. Okay, so let's return to the example uh, that we were dealing with related to databases. And what you'll notice here is I've got a database client open I'm interacting with a set of database tables, but then on the left side of my screen, I've got a very fine-grained policy language. And some of you in the audience may recognize this policy language because, of course, it was invented by AWS. So this is the Cedar policy language. 
that is now letting us govern individual operations inside of an interaction with a database, okay? So we're going to drill in here and say, you know what, um, I want to actually forbid all access to this uh, DVD rental film table, okay? Well, my next interaction with that table is going to deny uh, that, uh, that query. Um, you know what, if I have a, a query that involves multiple tables here and does complex joins, it's still going to deny it. Um, you know, if I use Cedar, if I use a Cedar annotation to um, maybe deliver a, uh, an apology uh, here, you know, I'm going to see this nice, sorry, the film table is not available at the moment message, okay? That's happening in the native Postgres wire protocol in response to a fine-grained authorization policy in real time at the table level, okay? Like, that ain't bad. All right, let's do a few more. Um, let's say uh, you know, we're concerned about some aspect of the content of this table. Um, so we want to actually, in the policy, say while it's permissible to query the table, it's not permissible to see the title of any content in the table. So you can see here that column is now redacted. And again, same thing, if that content is involved in a join with other, uh, other contexts, um, it's going to completely understand the semantics of that query and strip out anything that's not currently authorized. Let's say we're worried about the volume of information in that table. So rather than showing all thousand rows or something, let's, uh, let's just constrain this and say, you know what, um, you can look at that table, but you can only see five rows at a time. And indeed, if you involve that table in any other query, you can still only see five rows, okay? So this is a level of control and precision that um, uh, really, you know, you wouldn't imagine it was possible, um, and it's just right here at your fingertips in real time because of the Cedar language and this real-time policy enforcement. Um, let's, do, uh, let's do one more with this database table here. So, um, you know what, I'm, I'm fine if you're interacting with the database table, but I would really like to see a justification, okay? So what's happened here is uh, a user has interacted with some aspect of the infrastructure, some aspect, some resource, uh, in this case, performing a query, and What's happening is we've been interrupted, and that query is indeed suspended at the network level in real time. Okay? So I'm going to say, you know what? My boss made me do it. And that's enough justification to actually see that result set now. Okay? Um, so again, all of this is real time. All of this is precise control. All of this, uh, I don't know, feels good to me. Um, but let's go for a little more broad, a little more diverse example. Um, we're kind of database focused here. And, the whole world isn't just about databases. Um, sometimes the world is about SaaS products, like for example, Office, okay? So let's go ahead and interact with, um, uh, let's, let's go over here to the admin console inside of the Microsoft admin console. And let's say inside of the user management, um, let's say I want to actually change this guy's title from fork polisher to spoon polisher, okay? Um, that's a really cool, really cool change, really cool title. Um, but you know what? Um, people have been kind of messing around with these titles, so we, we want to have a little bit more governance on that. So let's, um, let's go ahead and forbid all access to uh, this particular operation inside of that console. And note, Microsoft actually doesn't provide you with that control. So there's no way natively in Microsoft's system to actually say you can't update someone's title. But with Cedar in the middle at a policy enforcement point, you can. So you can say when we try and change the title back to Fork Polisher, we're going to get a really nice error message here that says oh, maybe Venmo somebody $50 to authorize this action. Um, or you could see those very same uh, uh, requirements that we saw before for, for example, justification. Um, Everything in the system uh, recognizes the types of actions that might be appropriate to that context, and so we're getting autocomplete on all these concepts. So again, I'm going to autocomplete that action, and I'm going to say, let's go back to Fork Polisher. Um, he needs a better title. All right. Uh, one final um, note here I'm going to show also, just like that justification, um, you can also choose to, for example, So right now I've said, in order to update the user contact information, you actually have to perform an MFA, okay? So I'm now getting a push request on my phone, and you'll notice that the 
Uh, again, the operation has been suspended in flight. So this push request to MFA is coming through on my Duo app on my phone here, and I'm just going to click, okay, approve. And the moment I click approve, the policy enforcement point is allowing that request to proceed, okay? And again, custom error messages, custom feedback, all that stuff works, perfect integration with the identity provider, uh, no waiting, ta-da. All right, um, so we're getting very close to the end here. Um, I asked a question earlier about whether uh, whether in those earlier statements, whether you'd have enough evidence to prove your case to an auditor that you were controlling access, you had authorization in every case. So let's look at some of the evidence we've been collecting this whole time. So we can see every, every SSH command that's been executed. We can see every database query that's been executed. We can see actually a pixel perfect playback of of the Windows Remote Desktop session, okay? We can additionally see and understand exactly the geography and the context of each of those operations as they're being performed in the system. And every one of these context elements is present, subject to the fine grain authorization policy, and it's auto-completable, and it all updates in real time. So that's the demo. I hope some of that was interesting. Uh, and if it was, Please do join me uh, after, come see me. Uh, you can see StrongDM says right here, I'm easy to recognize, my name is Justin. Uh, come talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. And also our booth is as easy as one, two, three to remember. So we got booth number one, two, three. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. All right, thanks everybody.